Thanks a lot uh, for the invitation. It's super nice to finally be able to travel again and, and to come here. And I'm very happy to tell you about this work that I did in collaboration with Arun de Bray, a mathematician known for you, Marcus de Riegel, a postdoc at LME Munich, and Jonathan Hickman, which is in University of Pennsylvania. So it's about an anomaly that was not meant to be, but really that's not how we started thinking about this project. So let me give you like a couple slides about the big picture questions that we wanted to that we wanted to address. Okay, so the basic big question that we wanted to understand, I think as mostly everybody else here is, where is the landscape, or where's the, the set of possi possibly consistent quantum field theories and quantum theories of gravity, okay? And we have a bunch of techniques to understand both of these landscapes. For instance, for QFT, we've learned a lot from conformal bootstrap, from method of space and unitarity and the like. Quantum gravity, we have been able to make recent progress based on ideas coming from the Swamp Lamp program. Um, but if there is one technique which you can use both to understand, to, to put like rigorous solid consistency conditions in quantum field theories and in quantum theories of gravity, it's anomalies. Okay. So they are, you can have anomalies both in theories of gravity and in quantum field theories. You can analyze them with similar techniques. And the point is that if you have a, if, if you, if you have a, a, a symmetry which is anomalous and you know that uh, secretly, you would like to, to couple this symmetry to a background connection because of some other reason, so a dynamical connection, sorry, then you cannot do it. So anomalies provide the, the consistency conditions for, for symmetries like this. Uh, okay, so what we wanted to do, what we set out to do initially when we started working about this was to understand the duality anomalies. So to, to, to understand what's the use anomalies to study the duality group of type to be string theory and try to argue why it is what it is and not something else. So to be more concrete, let me give you a question that I would like to answer, okay? So when you go to type two B string theory, you go to any textbook and it will tell you that it has a, a duality symmetry, which is roughly speaking, there are some subtle details that one needs, one needs to talk about, but it's basically S and 2 Z. Now, this is something that you learn by studying the spectrum of massive objects like D brains and the like in this theory. It's not something that you can see from the lower energy Lagrangian. So what if someone was to come and tell you that they found a different quantum theory of gravity, which is not what you call type to be string theory. It's something that looks like it, except that the duality group is something else. It's like this gamma zero two. Some, it's a congruence of group of SL2C, for instance, or maybe something either, you know, even, even more, more exotic. So how could you tell them whether they are right and they found any quantum field gravity or they're wrong? Well, one idea, and that's the idea we try to follow is like, okay, sure. I mean, we know this one is consistent. SL2C works. So we expect that it, it has no anomalies. So this is, this is a duality symmetry. You can couple the theory to backgrounds which have non-trivial duality bundles. And you can ask whether there's an anomaly. And hopefully this one will turn out to be anomaly free. And then perhaps some other possibilities turn out to have an anomaly. And therefore, if you get lucky, you could explain at least partially why the duality group is what it seems to be here. By the way, I think it's, I mean, I didn't say it out loud, but please interrupt me at any point. Uh, also from Zoom with questions, comments, whatever, okay? Just stop. Okay, so that's what we wanted to do. Uh, so maybe you can use anomalies to explain why the theory, why the, why the, why the duality group of type 2b is SL2c, uh, not something else. And this is a question, the way I phrased it, that you could have asked 20 years ago, why, why people didn't try to do that? Well, um, the point is that we have, uh, at least to us, the point was that there's this classification of anomalies, uh, of, of uh, particularly for discrete groups, which can be obviously done by coordination theory. And the also part of the anomaly theory of type 2b was not fully written down uh, in all the details that we needed until recently. So that's why you could only ask this question, or at least all we could only ask this question recently. So the, the, the key theme is that you're going to use coverage in theory to be sure that you capture all the relevant anomalies and they're, you're not missing any. Okay, so that's the, you know, the, um, that's, that's the plan that we originally set out with. So if I were giving up talk about the prey that we originally thought we would have, I would start by telling, by telling you a little bit about anomalies. Then I would use what I reviewed to compute the anomaly of type 2b string theory. And then I would go to other duality groups and maybe find that some of them are anomalous, so I will give you some constraints coming from that. 
So that was the plan. Oh, oh yeah, please. Well, one simple remark that's obvious is that you wouldn't find an anomaly for a congruent subgroup. <laughs> because you can embed the converse group bundle into an SL2C bundle. Yeah. I agree. Yes. You might find one for a subgroup of SL2R that's not a congruent. That's, 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 that's like one of these triangles. Sure, yeah, completely right. Yes, this was not one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. In any case, we're not going to, in this talk, I'm not going to get to this cause of question. But because we actually, when we're doing this, we found a big surprise. Uh, and the talk is going to be more about the surprise. Uh, this is what surprised to us that the duality group of type 2 B string theory in 10 dimensions, in fact, has an OLS. Okay. So that's, uh, that's, 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 where, that's, that's where, the, where things went a little bit sideways in a sense. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to still keep the first two parts of this talk. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about anomalies. And once I'm done telling you about anomalies, uh, I'm, I, I, will, I will tell you about, the, uh, about this, this anomaly. Can I ask a very simple question? Please, please, so, just, just interrupt and ask. So why is this a problem? And do you need to, are you going to gauge this duality group for some reason? Why is it? Oh, yes, very good, very good. Yes. So you could take the shot, right. So there's, there's this general law in quantum gravity. Symmetries are either broken or, or gauged. Okay, there's not like there's 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 supposed to be no global symmetry in quantum gravity. Uh, we have, um, I think, up to, so I don't think there's a right now a general proof of that fact uh, that applies to any case, but for instance, we have proofs with certain assumptions in ADCFT. It's certainly true in perturbative string theory, and you can make black hole arguments uh, related to, to that. Yes, but more concretely, SL2Z, you can be much more concrete because generators can be seen as. Well, you can construct fan warp holes and so on. Yeah, that that's just they show that they're gauge symmetries. Uh, yes, yes, but but starting to talking about orbifolds is also like I could also say that I'm not allowed to talk about orbifolds. Actually, you can do orbifolds that you can see in low energy field theory without fixed points. So sorry, say that again. You can do it just in low energy field theory. Actually, in this particular case of SL2Z, you can see that if it's a symmetry, it has to be a gauge symmetry, just from constructions that you can see in low energy field theory. You don't need sophisticated arguments about black holes for that example. Um, but so you're saying that the, you're saying that you can construct lower energy black uh, your lower energy backgrounds that, yes. that would see already that there's an inconsistency if the thing is not if, it, if the thing is not gauged. Well, you can have monodromies around a circle by certain generators of SL two Z. Oh, that, sure, sure, sure. This manifestly makes oh, sense. Oh, but but then what if com comes and tells you that you can actually not have that? That there's well, a different there's no type to be. You'll soon find that you can't have anything. Sir? You will soon find you can't have anything. Sure, I agree. But then, but who, who's to say that there is not, in fact, a consistent? You'll find the whole theory is inconsistent if you find there's an anomaly in, in the SL2C. I, I, I agree. Uh, I, you agree, but you weren't quite saying that. That's why. No, 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 right, right, right. No, I, I, I agree, but my point is that to me, the, the, the reason why I agree with this is. Because of the black hole arguments, and I don't think you can have. No, you don't need arguments like black holes. I it's much more direct than that. Um, yeah, uh, like uh, you have to abandon all standard dualities. Sure. It, it, this again, if such a theory existed, it wouldn't be yeah. including T dualities here. I, I, you left with nothing. I, I agree. I'm not. I, Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Fine. Fine. I agree with that. I agree with that. You could, for instance, argue that you, if you have a worship description, that you can argue that some of these things have to be exact. That I completely agree. For instance, the duality you could. So, can I ask a question? So, I think you would agree that uh, four-dimensional abelian Maxwell theory is anomalous under a self, under duality symmetry too, right? Totally. Yeah. 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 Exactly. That's field theory, yes. I completely agree. And in fact, that's going to play a role later in the talk. So, okay. So, yeah, this is right. So, that's, that's a big surprise. And let me tell you quickly what are anomalies. Uh, it's like, it's, I'm just going to read the basic facts I'm going to need. So, the right. So, it, 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 roughly speaking, you have an anomaly when you have a theory with, let's say we have. Let me, let me just be talked about theories with like a Lagrangian description or some semi classical description. And you have some interesting property of the theory, which is not preserved by quantum effects. Typically, the thing that you're talking about is you have some, some theory with symmetry, and then you ask, can I couple it to a background connection? You can compute the partition function uh, as a function of a connection for that symmetry as a background field. And it sometimes happens that this thing is not getting barren. 
Now, of course, if this is just like a, a background field, there's nothing wrong with this. That is completely fine. But if this sketch field is dynamical, then this is a problem. Now, there's two classes. The, broadly speaking, there's two classes of anomalies. You can have an anomaly in a gauge transformation, which you can continuously deform to the identity, an infinitesimal gauge transformation. Or you could have an anomaly in a transformation for which you cannot do this. And we're going to be talking about this second class in this talk. This is the ones that we're interested in. Um, so it's, uh, and for instance, if you have a discrete group like SL2C, all anomalies are of this kind. So local anomalies, we understand them pretty well. They are well understood in the 80s. Uh, it is this procedure with an anomaly polynomial uh, and the testing procedure. So basically, if you have a theory in D dimensions and you want to understand local anomalies, you construct a polynomial in D plus two dimensions. And asking whether an anomalies cancel is whether this polynomial, the question of whether this polynomial, when you sum are all fields, identically vanishes. And for instance, I'm talking about type 2B string theory, and it's a very famous and beautiful fact that this happens uh, for type 2B supercapital. These things just cancel, which is uh, it's, it's really nice. So that's for local anomalies. And I'm not going to be talking about those any, anymore in this, in this talk. Uh, so I'm going to be focusing on global anomalies. So the way you understand global anomalies, suppose you have a d-dimensional theory with an anomaly. Uh, and the, the way you understand the anomalies in terms of an auxiliary topological field theory, invertible topological field theory in d plus one dimensions, which I'm going to call the anomaly theory. So it's just one particular theory. Which particular topological theory depends on which d-dimensional theory you're talking about? There are ways to compute it. And, you know, it, 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 for instance, if in d dimensions we, you had some, you know, like uh, the theory was living in some manifold and some migrant connection, then the d plus one dimensional theory also has, also depends on perhaps on the topology of the manifold, not on the metric, because it's a topological theory, and an extension of the background connection to this d plus one dimensional manifold. Now, it's a topological theory that means that it, it doesn't depend when you do small reform, it, it doesn't change its value on a particular background doesn't change when you do small deformations of the gauge field or the metric or whatever. But actually, there's a nice feature, which is that uh, there's a much stronger sense in which this thing is invariant. It's not invariant just under small deformations. It's actually invariant under covertisms. So what is a covertism? So here I have two different backgrounds. I'm sorry, there should be an M prime here. Suppose that you have two different D plus one dimensional space times with possibly different topologies and different connections. And it, suppose that is the case that the two of them together are the boundary of a d plus two dimensional manifold over which the d plus one dimensional connections extend. If you have a situation like this, then the anomaly theory evaluated on both manifolds is the same. And that is great. It leads to a huge simplification of, 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 of the question of what are the global anomalies. So if you're given a, 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 a field theory with some with some symmetry, is it, it is not obvious how many different backgrounds which have global anomalies can there be. And the classification under covertisms really helps you uh, understand this because the set of, 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 of backgrounds for a topological theory uh, can be uh, under this, 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 uh, this equivalence here, can, this, this relation here is actually an equivalence relation. So you can wash in the set of manifolds with connections by this. And you end up having uh, actually uh, a group. This thing has a group structure. And it's uh, and in all the cases that I found of like so far that are of relevance to physics problems, the partition group is actually finally degenerated. Okay. So what that means is that if you want to study all possible anomalies, you just need to study anomalies in the generators of the partition group, and you classify all of them. And there's finally many of those. So you're, at least it's like, a, like an amenable task. Uh, so as I said, the anomaly theory, you, you, can, you can think of it as a map from the border group into U1, it's a phase. And so there's global anomalies only if these groups are non-zero. So if you find that the group is zero, bam, you don't need to do anything else with global anomalies. But if the group is non-zero, you can still need to check that the anomaly is non-zero for some classes, okay? Now, I have a comment. I think you 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 meant, but didn't say that the theory is the anomaly theory is invertible. Yes. Otherwise, co covertism theory is not enough. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. I think if I didn't say that, I should have. 
Yes. Yes, totally, yes. It's, it's important, otherwise this equivalence between double ego theories and, yeah, that only works for invertible ego theories. Anyway, so that's the, that's, that's the new understanding, like the, the way you would understand anomalies. So for instance, if this theory maps to, to, to non-zero for some classes, then, then, then there's, there's, there's for sure no anomaly. But um, there's, 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 a, there's still a, a distinction between, the, between anomalies, the ordinary global anomalies that you would see in field theory that were discussed in the 80s already, um, and, 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 the, and the more modern anomalies that we're talking about here. So the, the anomalies from the 80s, for instance, you would study by, uh, you, you, would, you, you would be thinking of anomalies in a field theory, and so you would fix your spatial manifold, consider a closed path in configuration space for, let's say, the gauge field, and ask if the place of the partition function is well-defined under, under such a change. So what that means in terms of the anomaly theory is that you would be evaluating the anomaly theory on a D plus one dimensional mapping torus manifold only. So you would just take whatever manifold you start with, take it apart with a circle and have a varying gauge field. So that would be a closed path in the space of configurations, uh, which is not contractible and could have an integral phase. So anomalies or in, in ordinary field theories, they're all of this form. So, uh, so, so my, my point is that it, for, for the anomalies that were studied in, in field theory in the 80s, you would only evaluate the anomaly theory on mapping tori. But there's more general manifolds uh, than mapping tori. So absence of traditional global anomalies just means that when you evaluate the anomaly of mapping torus, is exactly equal to zero. What about those classes which are not mapping tori? Why, uh, what about them should we require for absence of anomalies that they are uh, that the anomaly also vanishes there. Uh, so the answer for that to that question, should you require the anomaly theory vanishes in every background, turns out to be yes, if you are in a context in which topology itself can fluctuate. Okay. So the anomaly in the, in the field theory case is just a closed path in configuration space from, from some configuration, from some manifold, some configuration of gauge field back to itself. In the theory, ordinary field theory, then you do it on a fixed manifold, and so you wouldn't change the uh, uh, you wouldn't change the the topology. But if you're in a context in which topology can change, for instance, you expect the topology can change in quantum gravity, or also, for instance, if you're discussing anomalies of the world volume theory of deep brains, because these deep brains can join and split, then you can make drawings like the one I did before, in which not only the gauge field changes as you go around here, but also the space time itself splits and reconnects. So that's topology change. Bottom line, in a theory of quantum gravity, or also in some other cases, imagine that there's no anomalies. It really requires that the anomaly theory is evaluated, evaluated to zero in all possible uh, coverages and classes, or regardless of where they're mapping to right. Yes, please. Even if you're just doing field theory on a fixed space time, you need a stronger condition. You're correct that originally it was only formulated in terms of Macintora. But in general, you actually need a stronger condition. Presumably this one. Uh -huh. um, and the reason is that the traditional statement of absence of anomalies says that the um, effective action is invariant under diffeomorphisms and gauge transformations. But it doesn't tell you how to define the absolute phase of the effective action. Yeah. Whereas this condition, well, I don't know if this is a truly universal statement. In cases I know well, you need this condition to define the absolute phase of the path interval. I, I agree. I, I understand what you mean. Y yes. The, so one thing that one could say is that if you're just interested in field theory in a particular manifold, you just cannot define the phase of that particular field theory in that particular manifold to be one. And then you don't need to talk about it. But as soon as you, are, you want to talk about field theory in a context where you can glue manifolds or whatever, then for sure you need this thing. I agree. Well, locality tells you that you're supposed to be able to cut in phase. So being able to compare different manifolds is part of having locality. So if you want, you could have alternatively expressed yourself. But admittedly, what I'm saying is partly an aspiration rather than something that's been completely proved. But presumably, to get truly local definitions, you, you need mean, this A equals zero. So coming to uh, after this discussion, if we agree on a theory of gravity, you would impose something like this, at least, or more generally, perhaps. 
then that very naturally leads to a three point strategy to compute in anomalies, uh, which is step one. You first determine what is the symmetry type and the relevant coverages. You compute the coverages in group, which can be done with, with some pain using uh, techniques from anti topology. So you compute the coverage group that determines the anomaly. Then you actually need to look at the field content of the theory you're talking about to extract the anomaly theory out of that. And finally, you just evaluate this on all the generators of this. You also need to find explicit generators for this. And once you've done all that, if it turns out that the anomaly vanishes, well, the just vanishes, and that's it. So uh, this is basically the review on anomalies. And I'm just going to be doing this for the duality symmetry of type to be string theory. Uh, any questions, any more questions before I go on to that? Okay, good. Well, I have only one comment. Yes. If you can do step two, you didn't really need step one. Uh, no, you're in an abstract situation. Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean an abstract situation. I mean- In an abstract situation, this is good idea. But in a concrete situation, like traditional particle physics theories, one can just do step two. Oh, oh absolutely. So what I mean here, for instance, is the recipe is like, if I have a fermion, then I know the anomaly theory is an eating variant. So this is right. That's, that's gives two, and you actually have to know one. Yes, once you have two, you know that the fermion is the normal case an variant, then you need to evaluate it from some so manner. You're today discussing a rather abstract problem where you probably want to start with step one. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just, yes, I'm just saying that if you're lucky, I, I put this in step one only because if it turns out that the vortex group vanishes, then there's nothing to do anymore. You, you, you do need to do all three things and you can get lucky and then, you know, for instance, you can argue, you can see, for instance, if your spectrum already contains non chiral bosons, you already know that step two is zero. So it's true. You need to do all of them and sometimes you might be lucky. Good. Okay, so let's let's try and apply this story to the duality symmetry of to be string theory. And one should start asking, we want to start by asking what is actually the duality symmetry of type to be string theory. The useful story is that you start with type to be super gravity, which has an SL2R symmetry that you can see in the Lagrangian. And then you say, well, in string theory, I have deep brains and other objects that actually break this to a, to a non perturbative subgroup SL2C. And this SL2C actually has a very nice natural F theory interpretation as the proof of dimorphisms of the, of the F theory torus. The theory tells you that type to be sick, you have a T2 floating around, and this is the dimorphisms of the T2. This picture can be made much more concrete once you do M to F theory duality. So you, you can compactify in a circle and understand an F theory background as a non theory background with uh, with T2, uh, with, with actually a physical torus and an theory background with a torus vibration. And the symmetry is nothing but part of the N theory deformation group. But once one starts talking in this language, you realize that things aren't quite that simple. Because first of all, SL2C is just the, 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 the group of large deformations of the torus if you forget about the fact that the theory has, uh, has fermions. If your theory has fermions, then you know, because of the fact that a rotation by two pi for a fermion is, is, is not just, um, it's not just the identity, but actually minus the identity, you need to extend this group uh, to a double cover of it, which is the metaclectic group, which is no longer a matrix group. So that's one thing you need to do. Um, another thing you need to do is because since you're thinking about, secretly you're talking about M theory on a torus, M theory actually makes sense on non-orientable space times. So that means that there is an additional diffeomorphism that you can do, which is just flipping one of the sides of the torus. Okay. And that actually, if you forget about fermions for a moment, that extends SL2C to GL2C. Okay. So these are two independent, sort of independent extensions that you need to do. By the way, this symmetry also, you can see in type 2 is for gravity is part of the symmetries that you use when you define an oriented fold. You need to do these two things. And once you see a diagram like this, you know that something is coming on the right side, which is the actual duality group that we're going to take for type to be super gravity, uh, which is something that takes into account the theory has fermions and also reflection symmetries, which actually have to be of pin plus type. So the duality group of type to be super gravity, which was as far as I, I learned about this in this paper by Tachikawa and Yonakura, is uh, the pin plus cover of, of GL plus. It's just some abstract matrix group that you can write. Okay. So that's How do you know that plus and not pin minus? Uh, sorry, uh, I think right here. 
How do you know it's pin plus and not pin minus? Oh, that's because that's because in theory it makes sense on pin plus manifold. So that it has to do with the one way of seeing this is the the um, right. So M -th the bosonic action of M theory makes sense on unorientable manifolds, and but the action also needs to make sense on fermions. The 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 gravitino or the supercharge in eleven dimensions comes in a real representation. Only pin plus in Lorentzian signature has real representations, not pin minus. So it has to be pin plus. Yeah, I know that, but why 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 pin plus of the duality group? What did you say about real representations? Well, I, I just said that. Well, I'm I'm just saying that I'm thinking about this as an M theory background. So I'm going to say it has the same symmetry type of M theory as M theory, and I know M theory has pin plus, uh, and it has pin plus. Uh, well, okay. right. The, the the type to be supergravity. Sorry. The, so how do you know it's pin plus? I mean, there are examples where there are pin plus manifolds which are pin plus and not pin minus. Certain RP ends, which yeah, so ends, M theory should make sense on. Is that the argument? Well, yes, exactly. So, for instance, so the, the argument the argument is that if you take the eleven dimensional action of M theory, it couldn't make sense on a pin minus manifold because the the, the supercharge would have to be complex, which it isn't. So that's already one argument, and that is consistent with the fact that M theory makes sense, for instance, on RP four, but doesn't make sense on RP two, which is pin minus or not pin plus. But it really is it's a, it's a more simple argument. Just look at 11 dimensional. If, if you're saying that M theory has some sort of reflection symmetry, then it needs to act on the fermions, and then it can only be pin plus. It cannot be pin minus. Now, of course, in compactifications, you can do more complicated things sometimes because you could, you could, you know, like um, you could get extra, extra, extra reflection symmetries where you flip one coordinate of the non-compact directions and one coordinate of the compact directions, and those can sometimes be pin minus as well. But in, a, in the most general background, uh, the, 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 11, the, the one that always is there in M theory is pin plus. Okay, so that's the guy we're going to be talking about. And let, let me give you a bit, like just just the slightest bit of background on the technicalities, the, 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 because, because all of these things are going to appear later. So how can we think of a, of a what, 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 what we would be saying is that the uh, type of supergravity actually makes sense on what we call on what we call spin GL plus structure, because the the spin part of it mixes with the duality group, as I explained before. So to explain that a little bit, I'm going to start with a more familiar case, which is just a spin C structure. Uh, that uh, in that case you have you have uh, you have a mixture between spin and U1, and you're poisoned by C2, which is the C2 subgroup of U1 and the minus one to the F here. And one thing that you do when you have a, a spin C structure to describe it efficiently, you actually take this. This thing is not quite a U1 bundle, but you can get out honest to go out a U1 bundle by just taking the transition functions here and squaring them. So you, from for a spin C, you can have an associated principal U1 bundle, and then manifolds which are um, spin C must satisfy a certain consistency condition, which is that the second step with the class is the modulo to reduction of the term class of this one bundle of this U1 bundle. For spin gel plus, you have a similar story. So spin pin plus is the same thing, just replace your one by pin plus, or the Z2 is the minus one to the F here and there. And that means associated to it, there's a principle. So when you square the functions of this, you get a GL2 Z bundle. So it has an associated GL2 bundle, okay? And in this using the other characteristic classes, you can define characteristic classes for these guys. So some of them have C4 coefficients, Z3 coefficients, or C2 coefficients. I, the, I, I wrote all the classes that I'm going to be using here, but they don't really, it's not like the, the details of this is, is, is that important. I just want to tell you that not every manifold has, a, has this kind of structure. Some of them do, and the abstraction to whether they do or do not involves these characteristic classes. In fact, it only involves this last one. Uh, and, and, but these other classes, which are characteristic classes of the duality bundle, are, are going to take, are going to appear, are going to, are going to have a role later on. So, uh, questions about this? Any question about this? What is C three tilde and G four tilde? Good, good, very good question. So those are those are classes with with um, um, with twisted uh, with, with twisted coefficients. Okay. So the point is that the Right. So these, these are classes which would be honest classes in MP2. 
but which get multiplied by minus one by the reflections. So they're not things that you can integrate on a manifold by themselves because integral of A will go to minus integral of A. But integral of A squared is well defined for you. And actually, in, for some of the anomalies, uh, if, if you're looking at anomalies that don't involve reflections, these things are, are going to be okay. So they, they, they do play a role later. That's the only reason I introduced them now. Okay. So that's the Dolity group of. All right, I have another question. Are, are you working in Euclidean signature or in Kaskin signature? Oh, I'm doing everything uh, right. Good, good, very good. So I'm I'm doing all the computations of the Bernstein function and everything in Euclidean signature. But the argument I gave before about the beam plus structure, for instance, that's an argument in Lorentzian signature. That's exactly what I was worried about. Yes, yes. No, you're completely right. The, the, the minus has real representation. It's quaternionic, right? In, yes, in, yes. In, it's, it's the other way. Around. You're right. You're right. It, it's the other way around. But the, the the okay. So the point is that if you're doing things directly about Fermi's Euclidean signature. You should be talking about having um, it's, it's, it's about having reflection positivity and reflection positivity is the continuation of unitarity in Lorentzian signature. So what you would ask, right, is like you have you, you can you can you can have a, 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 an action on the fermions so that you preserve reflection positivity and that's continuation from from being plus in Lorentzian signature. But but yes, that I, I use the Lorentzian argument to multiply the Euclidean. Uh, yes. How do we know the pin plus but doesn't, doesn't become pin minus under wick rotation? How do I know that pin plus doesn't become pin minus under a wick rotation? Uh, well, because pin plus you can do, for instance, for a space L, right? So pin plus means that, in our Lorentzian theory, it means that spatial reflections squared to plus one and time reversal symmetry squared to minus one. When you do weak rotation, the weak rotation flips the time coordinate and it makes it behave like the other ones. But bottom line, I can look at a reflection in one of the directions in which, which are not weak rotating, and those are the same. Good. So the duality group of that of gravity is this thing. Very good. Uh, so that's step one. We identified the symmetry type. Now we need to compute the anomaly. How do you compute the anomaly? Well, uh, in the, the algorithm that I put, the first step is compute the, uh, the Bordesian group. Uh, which actually, it's, 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 it's quite, a, quite a convoluted task, um, but we were able to do it uh, thanks to, to Arun's expertise on spectral sequences and algebraic topology. So this is the answer. Um, uh, this, like, we, we didn't write this in our paper. It's part of an, our, an upcoming project in which we're studying all, all sorts of duality backgrounds in all dimensions in type to be supergravity using coordination groups. Uh, but this is the answer. And well, uh, as you can see, there's many potential anomalies because the group doesn't vanish. But then, step two, you need to determine what is the precise anomaly theory of type 2 b gravity. Okay, so that's uh, that's the next step that we're going to be discussing now. Um, uh, oh, by the way, this is a new computation. The 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 the, the, the next step, which involves some subtleties. Uh, is computing the anomaly theory. So the anomaly theory that I wrote here has three pieces corresponding to the three chiral fields that you have in type of gravity to the uh, gravitino, dilatino, and self dual fold form. And as you can expect, gravitino and dilatino are going to be straightforward, and the self dual form form is going to take us some time. So this is coming from the gravitino. It's the difference of two eta invariants. Um, I will explain briefly what an invariant is. But it won't matter for the purposes of this talk. All that matters is that we can actually compute it. Yes, we'll get it. Is there a picture where the different factors in the the group come from? Uh, where there's there's a picture. What would it turn? Is it can I is there a way to understand physically where the different factors come from? The cement, the Z8. Oh yes, I'm gonna be giving you explicit generators for all these classes later on. So I'm gonna be telling you this class is generated by this, for instance, this class is generated by S11 mod C3, the 11 dimensional lens space. Okay. And we have, yeah, that's, that was actually part of the, so this work has pieces which are more, you know, like just computing, like computing this with spectral sequence or some of these invariants and others were more designed, like finding explicit generators for these guys. We knew they were there because of spectral sequence arguments, but we didn't know exactly where they were until we found a class that we knew. Actually, it's a generator. So we have this thing. Uh, there's just a difference of the invariants um, because of some, 
representation theory is not very important. And this is the contribution for the, the Latino. The important point is that these things we know how to compute, okay? Like there's formulas from mathematicians from the 70s for the kind of backgrounds that we're gonna be looking at. We know how to compute them. Uh, so they're not a problem. And this last piece, which is more complicated, involves the self level field and a contribution, uh, uh, which, is, which involves some, some characteristic class C, which is related to the triple trans coupling 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 um, F5 wedge Z3, uh, sorry, F5 wedge H3 wedge Z2 that you have in type to be supercraft. Okay, so as I said, the first two terms are quite standard. Uh, you just compute um, you just compute the, the, the anomaly for fermion, and that comes from uh, you need to compute this key time variant. This is regular sum of eigenvalues. We know how to compute it. And for the self fields, uh, things are more subtle. There's there's a, a lot of people who have worked in this uh, over the years, like uh, Monier, uh, more, but the formulation of the, this, the, the discussion that we're really following comes from a paper from last year, from 2020. Uh, from Chief Chikawa and Yonekura, which is really beautiful. I encourage you all like, to look at it because it's amazing. So, okay, how do you construct the anomaly theory? To construct the anomaly theory, what one usually does is you find that ball, you, you find a D plus one dimensional theory, which is chiral in the sense that when you put a boundary to it, it generates, uh, and the boundary generates a, a mode of the field that, that you're interested in. So, this is a theory. Uh, it involves a five form in 11 dimensions. This is theory actually does the trick, gives you the, uh, formally does the trick. It gives you the, uh, uh, a self-dual four form field on its boundary when you quantize it. It's just, you know, you can just solve the equations of motion and see that it works. And you want it to be a topological theory. So you take this thing and you just send the kinetic term of this thing to infinity uh, so that it, it becomes a topological theory, okay? So you can do that, but there's a subtlety. I have a one half here, and that one half is going to cause us pain because the formulation that I wrote here is good for you know for, for ordinary cohomology for 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 five form fields which are topologically trivial. But you can also have non-trivial uh, topological non-trivial configurations like you can have um, uh, you know like a scalar where phi goes to five plus one as you go around on a circle. Similar things can happen for the five form. And you need to define to make sense of this product, also in those cases. Well, it turns out that you can actually make sense of a product like this, or actually the quadratic term that we have here, uh, even when A is not polygonally non-trivial using differential cohomology. So there's, I'm not going into the details, but you can do it. But nevertheless, we want to divide by two. And in differential cohomology, the bearing that we have here is a map to U1. So there's no natural, there's no canonical way to divide by two. And so that means that strictly speaking, there's a ambiguity when we're trying to write down the topological theory that we started with, that we wanted to write down originally. Um, and, um, and, and well, it actually depends on, you can actually pick a consistent definition of one half A of which A of what that is. But there's in a general manifold, there's more than one possibility. So there's no canonical choice. So Q of A, this thing, is just called a quadratic refinement of the differential cohomology pairing. Okay, you can so you can try and find a you can try and find a, 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 a possibility, but it is in it, it is it's not clear how to make sense of it generally. There seems to be an ambiguity. We found an ambiguity when writing down the anomaly theory of this thing in the other dimensions. Okay, so how do we resolve this ambiguity? Okay. Well, so if, 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 if you are given one particular Q of A, let's say that you're told that in this manifold you're interested in, this is the Q of, of A that you need, to R, you need to use, then you can compute everything because you only have the anomaly, the, the anomaly theory of the so-called field in both an item variant, which we know how to compute. And then these other two pieces, they really depend on the choice of quadratic refinement. Uh, so there's, there's just, uh, so this R invariant actually just, once you know the quadratic refinement, you know what it is, just come from the path integral or flat connections. And again, I, I, I encourage you to look at the Sheta Zikawa and Yonekura's paper because they explain this all very clearly. And well, you were doing the path integral or the chiral four form field. And it couples to, as I said, because of the triple Simon's term, it also couples to F3, which H3. 
So, but it couples this thing when you're doing the pathing over, over, over the C4 field, it just acts as a background field. So you just have another term involving F3, which H3, that is term. Okay. Sorry, I have a few questions. Yes. So first of all, the anomaly theory, when you wrote a formula for the anomaly theory next the slide, two slides back, I think, as an as an eta invariant. Now we agreed it's an it's an known it's a previous slide. Yes, we agreed that it's an invertible theory. So uh, you don't mean the eta invariance valued in the real numbers there. In particular, no, the R invariant is, is in it is valued in a torsion group, I think. So, so, so you clearly mean that on an 11 manifold, you have the exponential of some factor, which is crucial, times this linear combination of eta invariance and R invariance. So my first question is, is it exponential of I pi times this or exponential of I pi over two or what? Um, I think it's exponential of pi I, that's right, because that's the usual term for the invariants. So the, your ARF invariant, it's, it wasn't clear to me where the ARF invariant in turn Simon's variant, invariant is valued. Is it valued in, the ARF invariant is, Value is Z2 valued or Z8 valued? It's not clear. So, so, so for, for, for this, for, okay, so for this theory, I took the definition that I showed you two slides in front of this. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I can prove it in general, but in all the examples that I looked at, this thing is valued. This argument variant is valued in Z8. Z8 value. Yeah, okay. so it so, makes sense. So, so, wait a second. So, if we, if we, if, So that so if we if we write this as exponential of i pi so if it's not z two valued then why is this um, well defined? Why is this thing the total thing well defined? Yeah, if it's exponential of i pi. So so the point is that the so there's an ambiguity, right? right. So so one thing you said at first, which is like this thing is an invertible theory. This thing is an yeah. invertible thing, but maybe you didn't see because of the blue thing, there's a one eighth here. So that is not really well defined canonically. Right? So um, that's, that's, yes, that's indeed bothering me. Yes. So that, that big problem is canceled against this other big problem. And the whole thing, as they prove in the paper by Tachikawa and Yonikura, is actually well defined. Well, um, that paper made a lot of um, assumptions. I think they even assumed the manifold was spin, by the way. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discuss that next. Okay. Um, now, but I have another another question, which is, um, some time ago, uh, following the important work of Witten and Hopkins and Singer, I wrote a paper with uh, Dima Biello. My name's Greg Moore, yes, and yes. we gave an eleven-dimensional turn Simon's uh, formulation of two B supergravity, uh, which which took into account self duality. So my question is. If you're aware of that work, is this different or equivalent, or did we get it wrong, or what? Oh no, I'm I'm sorry, I, I I'm I'm not aware of this, and probably I should be. The the, the we use the formulation of Tsukawashi and Yonikura. Uh, Your whole point was to write a churn Simon's theory in eleven dimensions that properly took into account the entire self duality of the Ramon Ramon field in terms of differential cohomology, specifically differential KO theory. Right, right, right. So the when the so if the K theory differential K theory is going to appear in the next slide, the the right. The, um, so I'm sorry, I, I don't have a good answer to that because I I need to look into that into detail, but I will. Uh, it, it, the, the the way the way I understand it, so they discuss the words also by 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 Monier, and they I, I think that they. In the end, they argue that all definitions should give the same results. But uh, yeah, sorry, I don't have a better answer than that. Okay. So these two terms, right? So this is this. Right. So the next question is if you take this formulation, right? So the, the, the nice thing about the Tsukawa Shigenakura paper is that they give a very explicit simple action in, in 11 dimensions for just one, one five form. They do the path integral explicitly and all of this business comes out in a quite explicit way. 
So the, the problem is that they need to choose a Q of A. How to do that? Well, um, in, um, in less than 11 dimensions, actually, if you have a spin structure, they argue that you can construct a, a canonical quadratic refinement. And in 11 dimensions, the case that we are interested in, they argue they can construct, they explicitly construct a canonical quadratic refinement for differential K theory, which is not the same as the differential commodity that I was using. But because in type 2 based string theory, uh, you, you, the, 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 the Ramon Ramon fields are valid in, in K theory, it's good enough for them. Okay? So the bottom line is that they show that assuming a spin structure, there is a canonical quadratic refinement. Um, and you know this is, and then they go on to show that anomalies cancel in type to be inserted in, in in backgrounds which are uh, which do not involve duality bundles. And this is enough for anomalies which do not have a duality bundle. But what we want is Q of A for an arbitrary spin GL two C manifold, right? Uh, so the construction they they have doesn't work for us. So we don't have a construction. I don't know how to construct a canonical quadratic refinement for a general spin GL manifold. So in that sense, that part of the problem is incomplete. But what I can do, and I will do, is to show you that if you assume that there is a kind of quadratic refinement for spin GL plus manifolds, generalizing the construction that they did for, for, for the spin case, then you can actually use that anomaly should cancel in a case without duality bundles to compute the anomaly in a case with a duality bundle, and then compute this anomaly reliably. OK? That's the basic strategy that we're going to follow. It's, 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 we are, we're sidestepping this definition issue. Uh, and we're going to relate some anomalies, which are zero, to some others, which are non-zero. And I'll give you an example of this later on during the talk. So we now have the borders and group, the anomaly theory. And we were able to find explicit representatives for the generators. So this is the point that he was raising before. And we actually could find generators. So the anomaly computation finally looks like this. So these are all the factors in the partition group. These are the generators. These are the uh, these, these are explicit generators for each of the Z2 factors. Uh, this, this, this X10 is the generator of spin partition in 10 dimensions. So it's a non-manifold. And X11 is, I, I will talk about it later on. But the point is that we can actually compute the anomaly. And did you tell us what's little X? Little one. Uh, yes, these are the, the C2, they're the C2 characteristic classes of GL2C. So GL2C has a, a, a cohomology, has Z2 cohomology, has um, cohomology with C2 coefficients at degree one generated by two classes, it's the pullback of those, of the classifying space. I think you could, for that, you could give the following definition. If you have a GL2C bundle, there's an associated rank two lattice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this was. So if there's a rank two real bundle, you're probably just taking W1 and W2. That's right. That's right. That's correct. You can actually associate more than one bundle. And yeah, so X is associated, for instance. Okay, so for instance, in GL plus, there's a. Uh, but your X and Y are both one dimensional classes. Right? Yes, correct. So Whereas I only defined one one dimensional class. Yeah, so there's more than two. The construction you, you explained works with two bundles. So you can take the representation. Okay, so in, in GL plus, you can act with rotations, right? Like there, the oh, there's this like the, there's a dihedral group embedded into you one, sorry, in, into into GL plus, and you can uh, you can take the two-dimensional array representation, and there's a W one and W two of that. W one is X, uh, W two is the W I was defining before, and there's also another representation where you just use the reflections by a sign, and that gives you the that gives you the the X. So it's two different real. Uh, representations, but, but yeah, all of them can be got in a stiffel Whitney classes of associated uh, vector bundles. So detector here, by the way, is just a coordination invariant, which is non-vanishing on this class. Uh, but online, anyway, we find some anomalies. Some of them we were we were not able to compute completely uh, because of technicalities with the invariants. This one. It represents a more serious ambiguity involving the quadratic refinement. Um, so there's that. I, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm still confused. I don't understand how this curly A that you defined um, is a function of differential KO or K. You didn't say if it's differential K or KO. I'll assume it's differential KO. Oh, 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 yes. Uh, 
but uh, it didn't look like a, it wasn't obvious to me that it that the background that the fields in the theory in the eleven dimensional theory the eleven dimensional theory are are differential KO classes. Oh right, no, it, it, because it's not obvious at all, and it you know it it, it might not in be. In particular, so your C check. I didn't understand how the C check has anything to do with the differential K theory class. Sorry, I didn't quite I didn't quite hear that. C check, C check, the differential refinement of F three wedge. Yeah, yes. H three. Yes. Is that a differential K theory class? No, 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 no. It's not. It's differential cohomology. But, but, but then, but then, how, how am I using a quadratic refinement, which I said it would construct for K theory for this guy, right? That's, that's your question. The action should be a function of a differential K theory class. The action you're writing does not obviously a function of a differential K theory class. I think what Greg is, Greg, I think what you're saying is a little oversimplified because I don't think K theory knows about non perturbative dualities. It's tied to a description by D brains. I um, think that's why the speaker said that um, he didn't have a complete proof that the canonical quadratic refinement exists, but he showed that it was, he will show it's unique if it exists. Exactly. I, I, I certainly agree with that, Edward, and I was going to come to that point later, but okay. But, I mean, but, but he said that um, he's using differential K theory to define fields. I think we're on the maybe, maybe I misunderstood, but then, but I thought that's what he said. But then, but then, I, I don't understand this curly A anomaly theory as a function of differential K theory. So what I really want is a quadratic refinement of the differential cohomology pairing. And oh, okay. the, so, 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 so this is so the different when you when you when you formulate a self dual theory, you have to choose a generalized cohomology theory. Yes. So. So make up your mind. Is it going to be differential cohomology or differential K theory? So I so this is this is a construction in differential cohomology. In the in the in the paper by Tachikawa, Shi and Yonakura, they, they do the construction of differential cohomology and then they argue that they can construct a, a canonical quadratic refinement for differential K theory. And I think the, the mixing apples and oranges. Sorry? You're mixing apples and oranges then. You've got I mean I different. Greg, I think our speaker acknowledged the logical gap when he said that he was going to assume and not prove that the necessary quadrant canonical refinement existed. Okay, I'll shut up. Yep. Yeah, so I, I, exactly. I don't, I don't have, the, I'm just saying that if you could give a prescription for a quadratic refinement for each, for, for each manifold, a spin yield plus manifold, it would be done. And I don't have such a description, but I'm going to be able to sidestep that in some cases. Okay, and that's what, those are the cases we're going to be talking about. Okay, so we have this thing, and the point is that you know we have uh, there, there's some there's some anomalies that are non vanishing, and in this one in this case for instance I say zero one half modulo one precisely because we the techniques that we have to sidestep the quadratic refinement sorry don't work here, and I'll be talking about this a little bit later on. But anyway, to us this was a surprise. There is an anomaly in type two b, and I should really uh, be quick. There's an anomaly in type two b. Unfortunately, I can be quick because I reached actually the end of my talk. Uh, this is the conclusion. Type 2B supergravity has a discrete anomaly symmetry. By dualities, you map to M theory. That means that M theory is actually no diffeomorphism invariant, and therefore it's an inconsistent quantum theory of gravity. Uh, any question? <laughs> okay. 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 Here's laughter. That's, that's good. It, it, when, you, when I give this talk by Zoom, it, 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 it works better. Uh, uh, of course, this is not the conclusion. One should have a little bit more faith. And so in a sense, there's a simple modification. What we're going to show next is that there's a simple, relatively simple modification of the type 2B transheimus term. So I'm going to shift this differential cohomology class that I was talking about before by this class that I put in brackets here. So it's a class that is constructed in terms of contracting classes of the tangent bundle and of, of, of power magnitude tricking acts. This is a like modal form reduction. And it's also built out of um, the, um, the characteristic classes of the duality bundle, the C2, C3, and C4 characteristic classes that I was discussing before. Uh, so you can construct a term like this. 
And when you do it, you're basically, when you go to the anomaly theory, you shift C by C plus basically this thing. Okay. So when you do that, the anomaly calculation gets a new contribution coming from Q of C. And when you take that into account, the thing that I didn't know how to compute, I still don't know how to compute, but all these other guys vanish. So now there's no anomaly. Okay. So that is the anomaly cancellation mechanism that we found. It's if you want this app version of a green source mechanism in the sense that it mixes continuous fields to these discrete classes, um, but it gets rid of the anomaly. And it's also interesting that because the, so the term that I wrote down involved twisted cohomology classes, it basically it's all under oriented for reflections. And that has to be the case because if I want to couple it to C4, the Ramon Ramon potential, it better be something that it has the same duality properties as C4, and which is all under duality transformation. Um, and um, and, 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 and a mechanism like that would only cancel anomalies in classes which do not involve reflections like these ones do. And so only anomalies above the dash line can be canceled with our mechanism, but that's precisely what we need. Yes? Yeah. So, so the ones above the dash line are for orientable manifolds? Sorry, sorry. The, the ones below the dash line are for orientable. The ones above the dash line, they only involve uh, MP, uh, the MP subgroup of. They are orientable manifolds. Oh, they, they're, they're all orientable. They are all oriented. Sorry, what is the distinction above and below the dash line? Yes, that the duality bundle involves it can be can be contained within uh, within a spin MP, so it only involves an action of duality, uh, which which uh, such that the SL2C transformation has determinant one. It doesn't involve. Oh, it doesn't involve uh, work tree orientation. Uh, work tree right. work orientation. That's, right. That's, right. That's exactly what it means. Or it says to work. Yeah, that's what it means. So only these anomalies can be cancelled. Uh, by this mechanism. And I'm going to now tell you a little bit how this works. But the point is that this, this mechanism, that the reason why this mechanism works is really due to some detailed cancellations that happens on the type to be spectrum. So I'm going to take one of the examples, one particular example, uh, the C27 anomaly. Um, is it okay if I take five more minutes? So let's for instance, this C27 anomaly. Now, C27 anomaly means that you can find random matter such that the anomaly is any integer model 27. Okay? Uh, so it could have been a priori, it could have taken any value model 27. But with the mechanism that we're proposing, it will be, I will explain now why only k equals 9 can be cast. So it turns out that k equals 9 is precisely the value that you get from the fermions of. Uh, of type to be string theory. So it's really, it's really nice. And similar coincidences take place in other cases. So how do we see in this case, I'm gonna do it in a bit, little bit of detail that only K equals nine works. Well, K equals nine is the C27 factor of borders and group. And as I, told, as I said before, is generated by S11 mod C3. So that's a lens space. And the, the non-trivial Kersen board system takes place when you turn on a duality bundle along the non-trivial one cycle of the lens space. So let's first look at the situation where you just have the geometric lens space. And, uh, and uh, so I, I, I denoted it by a zero here. So we turn up the duality bundle. We know that anomalies here vanish. We know it vanish. We know they vanish because this thing is actually a trivial class in board this. So they have to vanish. And so we can write down everything like this. And the point is that even though I don't know what the quadratic refinement is in general, I don't know how to construct it in general. I can use anomaly cancellation in some backgrounds to determine it. Okay. So if I go to this background and I turn on the duality bundle, I can compute these e time variants, include the factor of one eighth, and this is what I get. I get these numbers. And then because I turn off the duality bundle, then this thing is zero. So I have a bunch of things that have to add up to zero, but don't. Why don't they, they add up to zero? Well, because there's one contribution coming from the R invariant, which depends on the quadratic refinement. And therefore, I can figure out what the R invariant is. Now, I know exactly what the R invariant, what the possible quadratic refinements of the cohomology pair, of the differential cohomology pairing can be in this particular manifold because it's very simple, it's a lens space. So I know that there's just two of them, and they have R invariants uh, plus one four or minus one four. So, we know exactly which one it is. 
So just from the mandate that anomalies cancel when there's no duality bundle, we can actually figure out what the quadratic refinement is. And once we have the quadratic refinement, we can compute anomalies when the duality bundle is turned on. So now there's a new contribution from coming from the additional term that we wrote down. With this quadratic refinement, the only values, the only possible value that this thing can have is either zero or nine minus or nine over 27. Those are the only possible values. And it's nice. What, what, so once you, once you do this, this piece changes because you're turning on the duality bundle. And the value that you get from this quadratic refinement evaluated on this class is such that you cancel an object, also in this duality bundle. Oh, sorry, also in this background. So that's, that's the trick we used. We used anomaly cancellation without the duality bundle to figure out what the quadratic refinement is. And then we used it to, to show that anomalies cancel also. This didn't have to be the case. It could have failed, but it doesn't. Questions about this? Okay, I think I need to be quick. So anyway, similar coincidences take place in the rest of the novel's classes. So you can always find the quadratic refinement like this in such a way that with the polynomial term that I wrote down before, anomalies can be canceled by the proposed mechanism. Um, there is one class which we were unable to compute in which we were unable to compute the anomaly. Uh, um, that's this, this, this one of the generators involving, involving reflections, involving orientable backgrounds. And so we found an explicit generator for it, which actually took a lot of work. And it's just a question of spheres. Uh, where the where where there's an action by Z to them Z two. This manifold is not spin manifold. It's also not spin C manifold, but it means a spin D eight structure, which means that it also has a spin GL plus structure. Uh, and so we can argue that the invariance vanish, but we're unable to determine the quadratic refinement simply because in this manifold there's no way to have it. You know, duality bundle switched on, duality bundle switched on. There's just not such distinction in this one. So we don't know what the value of the anomaly is, but we know that it can only be zero or one half. And, and so there's a possibility, you know, you could say that there's one choice of the value of refinement for which is always zero. And you could just take that one and then there would be an anomaly here. But again, I'm not able to argue that this has to be the case. Okay, so just briefly, I will mention that there's, there's a slight non-rigorous check it would be nice to do it more rigorously, more rigorously and a, a, a check that you can do of our term, which is that it seems to match, at least in some cases, the only anomaly of n equals four super n mills. So n equals four super n mills is mapped by holography to eight is five versus five. And a very general story is that when you have an anomaly in a duality symmetry, uh, uh, sorry, when you have a global anomaly in the boundary CFT, it is matched by a topological term in the bulk. Now, the Montone duality, olive duality anomaly has an anomaly uh, that was computed, sorry, the Montone olive symmetry of n equals 40 prime mills has a duality anomaly that was computed by Satoshikawa, Shen, and Yonekura. And how do you match it in the bulk? Well, if you do, uh, this, 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 this is not rigorous because we didn't do this uh, properly at the level of differential cohomology even. But if you just write down this term that we have in the action, which is the one that is, is the only relevant one, and you reduce it on formally, you just reduce it in eight is five versus five, you get something that matches the value of the anomaly that they find. Now I did this very quickly, but the point is that the polygon theory that we have evaluated on this background matches the anomaly. So, so that's one simple check that one could take. So in the end, it seems to be a happy story for type to be. But just like any good story, it actually has a twist in it because we found more than one way to cancel these anomalies. There are alternative ways which uh, involve the so-called topological green source mechanism. So the idea here is that you take type to B and then you're just gonna couple to some BF theory. Okay, so it just involves, it's, it's a topological theory. So it, it, it doesn't change the action of low energies, but it changes the, it changes the degrees of freedom. And so you can, you can write down be a theory with the right couplings such that uh, you, can, you can make things such that the partition function of this BF theory can do the same job that the Q of C new term that I was discussing before was doing. 
So it, it, can, it, can, it can do the same for at least for some of the anomalies. Now, what you should do systematically is to compute omega 10 spin plus, spin GL2 plus, and that will classify ambiguities in canceling the anomaly. Uh, that is true. Uh, okay, I see what you mean. What I'm doing here, I'm actually changing the symmetry type of the theory, right? I'm entering also like additional fields, additional discrete fields. So these have, these have like one for symmetries. If the anomalies can be canceled, yes. then any other way of canceling anomaly involves adding on some other anomaly-free theory. Mm -hmm. And presumably that anomaly-free theory is supposed to be a, 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 an invertible theory. Right, right. Otherwise we'd see it in oh, perturbation. Oh, oh, good, 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 good. Thanks. And as you said earlier, those are basically classified by omega 10 of 12 hours. Yes, yes. Invertible theories yes. are classified by omega 10. Yes. This is not an invertible no, theory. I know. It isn't because you said it was a different way to cancel the anomaly. Yes. But if the other way is correct and also the new way is correct, then they the differ by an anomaly. They differ by an invertible theory. I see. I see. Uh, right. So the, the point the point that I that I'm making is that if these things work, these things are definitely not ordinary type to be because you have equations of motion for for the BF theory for these additional discrete fields that you know force some characteristic classes to vanish. So for instance, there's there's some backgrounds like you know uh, you could you could consider type to be on a lens space with quality bundle turned on. That would be okay in ordinary type to be string theory, but it wouldn't be okay in this thing uh, shifted by the duality bundle. Uh, because the sorry it's shifted by the BF term because the BF term means that only backgrounds where X3 are zero and it wouldn't be zero on on a land space with with non duality bundle uh, are, are allowed. So we found these alternative ways to cancel the anomaly. And the question is whether they are consistent or are they actually inconsistent during the swamp point? And, and, and we just don't know. Uh, um, Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm thinking about, about your point that they should be classified, they, they should be mapped no, to. Actually, what you're, what you're saying actually contradicts what I said. So perhaps I was. What I said was certainly an example of how you could modify an anomaly free theory. Yes. I don't see what's wrong with this. Um, sure. But then maybe there's something obviously wrong because. I can't do real time. No, 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 no. Um, okay. So the, basically the question that we have is whether these things are actually consistent or in the swamp. And so just to finally wrap up, this is part of a bigger question of whether the, can there be more than one consistent quantum gravity with the same low energy limit? So I just asked this question about type to be like, uh, could there be like alternatives? Like where do you have these topological terms switch on? Uh, could they be, you know, could, they, could, could, could there be like a plethora of, of different theories which have the same type to be for gravity limit? So could the end theory star more, look more like a flower like this with more than one petal per side? So for instance, in 11 dimensions, Fred and Hopkins have discussed uh, precisely based on a classification based on, on cover distance, they discovered a new theta angle in 11 dimensions. Is that theta angle, it's a discrete theta angle, so you don't see the low energies. Does it mean that um, there's two versions of theory in 11 dimensions? That's, that's a question I'd like to understand better. Um, but for the time being, I've reached my true conclusion, uh, which is that even though type 2b duality symmetry is anomalous, it can be canceled by modifying the type 2b transaminous coupling. And this didn't have to work. It works because of you know, coincidences. And uh, it's always so we don't know if they are consistent or not. We should also follow consequences of this term that we propose in the quality web. And it would also be nice to find a way to construct a common quadratic refinement uh, for this. Uh, excellent. So, with that, uh, I want to thank you very much.